as Les Trois Stooges. With unerring precision, they captured the complicated essence of American life, and by extension, American theatrical life, in their expert revision of the motto of Alexander Dumas' Three Musketeers, one for all and all for one, to which the incisive Curly added, Curly added, and every man for himself. <laughs> so that's my subject, the one and the all for each other and for themselves. In the spirit of the Stooges, I will digress whenever possible, including right now before I get to the point. I'm not sure how to talk about my subject, in part because I don't know what language to use. We have scholars here, critics, administrators, and practicing artists, sometimes all in the same body. More, I've lost track of the language of our art. After 17 years of running a nonprofit, it's been replaced by strategic planning and program assessment. It's been trumped by meaning deplete market aping cliches of our professional shop talk, branding, innovation, entrepreneurship, and by the hollow repetitions of grant speak that have sucked the specificity out of, for example, such essentials as community vision values. Somewhere maybe lives a root language of theater for us to speak with one another. Somewhere maybe is a tongue for wor with words for what we do, how it lands on the human spirit, how we share space and time, story, myth, intention, and feeling. Somewhere there's an idiom of our being together, a dialect of presence. I wish we could pledge allegiance to an ever new coinage, the shaky, groping, overheated, imprecise, exuberant, vulnerable, earnest diction of mid-discovery. I've spent part of the past 10 years revisiting, collecting, and editing the words of the American theater's uh, fanatical founders in search of an original language. Fanatics like the group theaters, Harold Clerman for one, Susan Glassbell of the Provincetown Players, W.E.B. Du Bois, Hallie Flanagan, Margot Jones, Zelda Fitchhandler, uh, who you just heard Polly talk about, Luis Valdez, Charles Ludlam, Douglas Turner Ward, Herbert Blau. They write in impassioned, heart-pumping phrases that help me get through the day by cutting through the accumulated noise of a half century of institutional and professional cant. As you heard when Polly quoted Zelda, they all got where we're going before we even arrived. One phrase kept surfacing as I, kept, as I prepared to speak to you today. It's from Julian Beck, who, as you may know, back in 1947, founded with his wife, Judith Molina, the still living, living theater. Beck's meditations read like rabbinical fire, fervent, philosophical, ecstatic. They burn for a truer theater, and more importantly, a better world. Amidst the flames, there's an almost throwaway statement. Its simplicity has haunted me. 1962, New York City. Beck writes to himself, I do not like the Broadway theater because it does not know how to say hello. 50 years have passed since he wrote those words, 66 since the Becks started their theater. The American theater in that time exploded. Off-Broadway, off-off, regional theater, alternative regional theater, community-based theater. The living theater's experiments in poetry, politics, company, global activism have likewise exploded. And even those whose sole image of the backs has them naked and chanting in the streets or against a massive backlit scaffold demanding paradise now are in some way heirs to their experiments and ameliorative ambitions. Ameliorative theater, Judith Molina dubbed it, to be useful. We are all, I wish to believe, enemies of the kind of falseness Beck finds on Broadway, where he claims the tone of voice is false, the mannerisms are false, the sex is false, ideal, the Hollywood world of perfection, the clean image, the well-pressed clothes, the well-scrubbed anus, 
odorless, inhuman of the Hollywood actor, the Broadway star, and the terrible false dirt of Broadway, the lower depths in which the dirt is imitated, inaccurate. I want to know how to say hello. I want our artists to know. Maybe that's why I can't get the phrase out of my head, why I repeat it to you today. I want to greet you from the deepest part of me and hear from the deepest part of you. I want nothing less from our theater. I want theaters to feel like rooms. I want what passes in them to engender intimacy, even if the performances are wild, flamboyant, and artificial things. I want to speak in your ear and have you speak in mine. I want performance that feels like revelation. I want to be in it, wherever it might be, together. I want to know how to say hello. Specifically, I long for a language of individual distinction. Somewhere in the decline of critical attention, the rise of celebrity, and the homogene ho how do you say that word? Homogen you know what I'm trying to say, of production, <laughs> we've lost the knack for celebrating the specifics of talent. What makes one artist distinct from another? What are the unique gifts of this writer, that director, each actor? How can we point the way to those singularities in words, the way one writes or plays or moves from what one is, from the fullness of the available self? What is the I from whence the individual speaks to us, the something that novelist Marilyn Robinson calls incandescence, that presence shaped around I like a flame on a wick emanating itself? How does what we receive from the world get translated through the artist's unique perspective and imagination? And once translated, how does it, to use her great phrase, emanate itself? If art is, as a painter once said, nature as seen through a temperament, how can we, as collaborators, teachers, co-citizens, nourish artistic temperament and celebrate it? I was thrilled to hear Karadad speak of the body this morning. What's unsellable about our bodies? What do bodies carry? What do they receive? What do they transmit? As Karadad notes, every artist is her body. Every artist is the history of that body, the cultivation of its mind. And if we would know the world beyond consumer profiling, thumbs up or down criticism, categorical interaction, and tribal affinity, we must find this fullness. How do we do that? I love this description by Elena Passarella from her kick-ass book of essays about the voice entitled, Let Me Clear My Throat. I love it for its brazen specificity. In The Harpy, it's an essay, Passarella describes the lead up to becoming the first woman to ever win New Orleans Stella and Stanley screaming contest. You know, Stella, this is her. My scream moves through a body that has been in working order for over 33 years. It is a five foot six and one half inch female body, about 140 pounds, and its bone structure appears larger than the, those of most women I see in the park or at the gym or in the market. Only one of these larger than average bones, a metatarsal, has broken, but this still affects the body posture and thus, according to some, the resonance of the voice. I think, however, that the warped state of the neck and shoulders after years in front of a laptop alters the sound much more significantly. 25.5% of this body is fat and up to 60% of its water. It is not without its tonsils or its appendix and it has never been impregnated. All these things are part of the sound you hear when I sigh, sing, or say hello, or scream it. How can we attend to each other's gifts with this kind of specificity? How can we listen for the particularities of diction, the evolution of concern across bodies of work, the balance of hesitation and attack that marks one's approach to the world, how do we make a theater a world that gives the individual his or her fullest stature? 
I realize I'm on page nine, and I'm now getting to my main point. I, that was all digression. I guess. <laughs> According to the voluble Harold Clerman, who talked into being the seminal group theater of the 1930s, it's only in the company of others that the individual can reach full flower. Clerman writes of the group, we believe that the individual can achieve his fullest stature only through the identification of his own good with the good of his group, a group with which he must help to create. Is this true? The individual reaches fullest stature only by tying his own good to that of the group? Doesn't the individual gain stature from the spotlight, from having us stare at him until in our eyes he grows huge, mythic? This is really what I want to address today, the individual and the group, the I and the we of the theater, how we fulfill ourselves, how we greet one another, treat one another, how hard it is to reconcile one and all, my themes are lifted from Clerman, the individual, fullest stature, identification of personal good with group good, the group each must help create. I'll talk a little history and look at how it's playing out now. I'll tell you a story with a happy ending, spiritual revolution, history rewritten, a secret society grown up in full view of the palace, no longer a secret. My greatest personal excitements in the theater happen in apparently contrary contexts. On the one hand, there is the often private, fiercely individualized playwrights laboratory at New Dramatis, where I work. In that lab, I've had my mind blown by writers' imaginations, by their output, by the combustion or maturation of their voices. I've been thrilled by their acts of sudden illumination. On the other hand, for me, there may be nothing more electric in the theater than the collective, crazy, creative furor of an ensemble. It's not for nothing that the institutional theaters and critics and funders are looking to ensembles to reinvigorate our field. How do we reconcile these separate excitements, these seemingly distinct realms, the independent, maybe even solitary creator or actor, designer, director, and the genius of the group? It's a tough one. I spend my days advocating and making space for independent artists, even as I long for company. Artistic freedom and individual voice on one side, inspiring collaboration and common good on the other. The struggle to reconcile the ambitions of I and we has plagued the American theater for a 100 years. This tension between the individual and group between, um, is, I believe, a defining challenge of our theater, probably our culture. The Three Stooges agree. The fusion of individual talent and collective energy fuels great theater. It has always been so. The history of dramatic literature is inseparable from the history of the acting company. Shakespeare and the King's Men, the Troupe de Moliere, Sheridan's Drury Lane, Chekhov and the Moscow Art Theater, Brecht, Churchill, Walcott, Fugard, and on and on, fresh theatrical language forged where playwrights and players adventure together. Look at seminal 20th century directors, and the case is just as clear. Strayler, Manushkin, Brooke, Littlewood, Barba, Suzuki, Lecompte, all create in the context of company. New performance and methods of performance almost always rise from the individual and group adventuring together. The fusion of individual talent and collective energy fuels great theater. We know this. But still, in America, it's nearly impossible to sustain their communion. Or it has been. The original Provincetown players, circa 1915, a marriage of Eugene O'Neill's capacious talents, the oracular energy of George Cram Cook, and a constellation of the leading artistic, intellectual, political lights from America's first Bohemia, right here in Greenwich Village, lasted only a few years. The group theater, which spawned every major acting school of mid-century America, Strasburg, Adler, Lewis, Meisner, great directors Clerman and Kazan, and the seminal playwriting voice of Clifford Odets, 
The group struggled against the pull of Hollywood and the endless difficulties of negotiating individual agency and collective leadership before folding at age 10. The Open Theater, Second City, The Steppenwolves, The Worcesters, name a major gathering of theater talent, that pivotal coming together of solo and group gifts that de defines a moment. These genius scenes, or what Brian Eno dubbed senius, name one such theater senius that hasn't been battered by A, economics that lead underfunded individuals to more lucrative careers, B, a national character that values individual accomplishment over group connection, and C, the physics of centrifugal spread and entropy. Some groups dissolve, some morph and flourish, some keep on keeping on with what novelist Stanley Elkin brilliantly calls the persistence of the obsolete. There are two ways history always also tells us to sustain a theater in the US. The first way is to institutionalize, to establish an organization that is viewed as essential to the community or place in which it grows, and to maintain that entity even beyond the career span of the people who initially gave it life. The second way to sustain a theater here, the harder way, is to balance the evolving needs of the individual artist, voice and ambition, with the evolving group genius to balance the needs of self-determination and those of common good. This is the harder way. In institutional life, human beings are, for the most part, replaceable. They serve, necessarily and rightly, institutional identity. In company or group culture, each member must be reckoned with, must be given their lead. Care and feeding of individual and company goes both ways. If this second approach, that which holds the individual and the group in equitable esteem, were easy, the history of our theater wouldn't be strewn with the corpses of ensembles and company-founded theaters. The story of our most recent theater, of the past 30 years or so, is often told as a history of domination by institutional theaters. This is the critique that has defined many of us, myself included. But I'm here to tell you that that is not the story. The story is a story of revolution, quiet, sustained, many-headed. It's the story of a rise of democratic practices, the exploration and elaboration of methods of participation and shared leadership. It's a history of experiment, not of form, but of process, practice and process, how we collaborate and care for one, one another how we interact with community. It's a story of relationships between individual and group, inside and outside the theater. You may already know this story, but let me tell you again. First, you have to meet the cast of characters. We know the names of American theaters over looming institutions, but do we follow with equal intensity the careers of the long-lived process revolutionaries? After Provincetown and the group and the living theater and Free Southern in Jim Crow, Mississippi, the San Francisco Mime Troupe and El Teatro Campesino came Junebug, Roadside, Pregonas, Del Art, Bloomsburg, 30 to 35 years old, Cornerstone, Double Edge, and after them came San Francisco's Intersection for the Arts, Minneapolis's 10,000 Things and Pillsbury House, theater offensive in Boston, and too many to name. I experienced an epiphany last summer, the sort I considered myself past. I grew up in Chicago before the off-loop theater boom there, and have stayed fixated with a kind of exile's fascination on that city's theatrical doings. In 1990, after dozens of interviews and months of research, I wrote for American Theater Magazine what I felt was a definitive seminal, never to be surpassed history of that city's theater. <laughs> its roots in improvisation and oral interpretation, its major artists, and its then all too evident maturity, Robert Falls at the Goodman, Frank Galati everywhere, Steppenwolf doing Steinbeck on Broadway. In 2011, I reprised my exceptional summation as a keynote at the first ever Chicago Theater Symposium. Then, 
last summer, Northwestern University Press asked me to review a book it's considering for publication entitled Beyond Steppenwolf, Chicago's Established Alternative Theaters, edited by two recent PhDs, also practitioners, Jennifer Schluter and Erica Milkovich. I was skeptical. Come on. Beyond Steppenwolf are Steppenwolf wannabes. If these oxymoronic, so-called established alternatives exist, why don't I, Todd London, of all outside experts, know about them? It seemed like the usual carving out, I'm sorry in this context, of academic uh, territory, elevating the insignificant to a stature it hasn't earned, either out of personal connection or on the urgings of tenure. I was skeptical, and then I was surprised. I read about theaters I knew a little, Red Moon, the neo-futurist prop theater, and about theaters I'd only or never heard of, The Annoyance, Curious Theater Branch, Theater Ublek, Plasticine Physical Theater, 500 Clowns. I read about these theaters 25 years old, riding the line between amateur and pro, working with incestuous, fluid, conscientiously collective structures, unimaginable in more institutional contexts, experimental in aesthetic and interactivity, working fast like the neo-futurists or slow like Dexter Bullard and the plasticine folks, working outside and inside of conventional theater spaces like the fantastic Red Moon, passing talent back and forth like game's mother Viola Spolin's imaginary ball way back at the beginning of Chicago's post-war improvisational theater nativity. Light bulbs popped. Here it was, before my eyes for a quarter of a century, and unseen in the shadow of the Goodman and Steppenwolf and Mayor Daly II's building boom and all the fine mainstream and ensemble strivers who emulated Goodman and Steppenwolf. Here it was before my eyes, an unseen seniors. What else, where else wasn't I seeing what was hiding in plain sight? I could click my way through a collection of similarly aged, similarly spirited companies in the Bay Area in the Twin Cities. I'm at work through New Dramatist with a nutty collection of individual ensemble talent and alternative structure in Austin, Texas. The Rude Mechanical, Salvage Vanguard, Physical Plant, Rubber Rep, and Trouble Puppet. What about Was Washington, Boston, Seattle, Atlanta, Iowa City, Baltimore, Louisville? What is happening and either not seen or not collected together and so seen whole? Even in this city where I live, all those differently configured collectivities, the civilians, elevator repair service, Nature Theater of Oklahoma, Radio Hole, Richard Maxwell's New York City Players, Labyrinth, the Debate Society, the now imploded 13P, these are not young companies, any more than Philly's Pig Iron or New Paradise Laboratories are. Established and alternative. It wasn't just an epiphany, it was a geography a new map. I know it sounds like I'm talking about proliferation, and to a certain extent I am, but that's not the point. Yes, the undergrowth has become the field, but the transformation is deeper. The revolutionary change is one of process. How a generation of theaters, many now in advanced stride, have miraculously negotiated the hundred-year war to reconcile individual and company. And let me be clear. As someone devoted to playwrights and the art of soloists, this is not a revolution of devised work, one of the great misnomers of our contemporary theater. This is a fusion revolution, the making of companies that call forth the, the unique strengths of their members. The aesthetics are a smorgasbord of difference. Many of these companies work with playwrights, sometimes a single one, sometimes several at the same time. Some of them storyboard their creations. Some make two-minute plays. Some improvise. Some write in pairs or teams. Some are led by author directors. Some use documentary techniques and verbatim dialogue. Others draw on community story circles and then invent the text. New ways of making work, new ways, new meetings of individual talent and group ethos. And again, they aren't young companies. They are 15 and 20 and 35 years old. 
On the surface, they share very little. Where it matters, they share everything. They pursue and have, in many cases, nabbed the elusive grail of true merger between individual and group agency, leadership, and yes, vision, also known as democracy. What exactly is this revolution of practice and process? Recently, as Karadada and I were editing the, uh, my collection, I came upon a phrase I wrote 25 years ago. The way we make theater is as important as what we make. In hindsight, I realized I didn't know what I meant by that, or how much a vague belief in this aphoristic truth would guide my life. Fortunately, there were folks out there who had already figured it out and knew what to do with what they knew. They knew that their methods and practices carried their human values more than the product or result. When I spoke to Mark Valdez, the ebullient executive director of the Network of Ensemble Theaters, he confirmed my epiphanic uh, insight. Yes, the alternative is now the mainstream. Yes, they lead with their human values. And yes, in Mark's words, the process yields the aesthetics. What are those aesthetics? What are the values worked out in practice? The ensemble theaters through NET um, have done a great job defining those values. Collaboration, transparency and decision making, inclusion and diversity, mutual respect. Ensembles stress flatness in decision making where everybody brings ideas to the table, everybody's ideas are valued. True collaborations is not a means to an end, but an end in and of itself, a goal. Human dealings inevitably play out on what Mark Valdez calls a spectrum from consensus on one end to hierarchy on the other. The process revolutionaries, these many companies, committed to the quality of their interactions, spend way more time at the consensus end. When things move inevitably towards hierarchy, they strive to keep those hierarchies clear and to increase participation in leadership. As for inclusion, diversity, these are not concepts applied after the fact or after the funding. They are the heart of the practice of literally and figuratively taking everybody in. Take a tip from the apples. In art as in botany, monoculture leads to decline. Biodiversity and cross-pollination are necessary to our survival. The same is true of democratic art, and none is more democratic in its bones than theater. What to say about the fourth guidepost for process revolutionaries, mutual respect. My colleague Ben Krywaz of Nautilus Music Theater in St. Paul kicks off his powerful two-week-long studio for composers and librettists by reading a story, or maybe a myth, adapted from the introduction to M. Scott Peck's A Different Drum. It's a story I think about almost every day of my working life, and I'll tell, you, tell it to you now. It centers on a religious order that has all but died out. Only five disciples remain in the decaying monastery, all over 70 years old. The community's father, Abbot, See, seeks advice from a rabbi who periodically takes hermitage in a nearby forest. He tells the rabbi of their struggle, and the wise man commiserates. I know how it is. The spirit has gone out of the people. They weep together. Before he leaves, the abbot again asks for advice, but the rabbi has none to offer. The only thing I can tell you, he says, is that the Messiah is one of you. Of course, the humble brothers and sisters don't know what to make of this statement. How could one of them be the Messiah? Brother Thomas is a holy man, but he doesn't smile much. Sister Mary is just too crotchety, though she almost always proves to be right. Philip is so passive, a real nobody. Miraculously, though, he's somehow always there when you need him. Maybe he is the Messiah, and so on. Finally, the narrator gets to himself. Of course, the rabbi didn't mean me. I'm just an ordinary person. Yet suppose he did. Suppose I am the Messiah. Oh, please, God, not me. 
As they contemplated this riddle, the story continues, the old people slowly began to treat each other with extraordinary respect on the off chance that one might actually be the Messiah. <laughs> they find in each other the graces that might save them all. And just in case they themselves might be the Messiah, they begin to treat themselves with extraordinary respect. In time, the old monastery, which people occasionally visited on their wanderings through the woods, draws more and more people. An aura of extraordinary respect seems to radiate out from the community. More visitors come, some stay, including younger disciples. And so it came to pass that within a few years, the monastery had once again become a thriving order, and thanks to the rabbi's gift, a vibrant center of light and spirituality in the realm for mutual respect. None of these precepts, these intentions of one for all and all for one negate the fifth excellence. They do, though, it seems to me, recast our notions of excellence. They demand more of it, calling for excellence in our relations as well as in our outcomes, a standard for our humanity in addition to that of our production. Yes, the way we make theater is everything. Our practice, our aesthetics, our relations, our gift to the world. Of course, all theaters say they value collaboration, transparency, inclusion, respect, and excellence. I've done my best today to avoid a critique of institutional culture within our theater because I want so desperately in my life to move past it. Past it. But here is where the double bind of empty language and falseness or lack of candor among institutional theater leaders make it tough. Yes, we are all good people. We've all gone into the theater for the best of reasons. None of us is getting rich. But no, not all practices are built on these foundations. Jobbing in artists, short rehearsals, top-down administration, Black History Month diversity, chatting with a guest artist on the first day of rehearsal and again at the cast party, choosing the project or playwright the time signaled out last season, these are not the same as putting our methodology where our mouth is, believing that the way we work, the structures we create, the means to fulfilling our missions, missions are as value-laden, as important, as artistic as what lands on our stages. The pursuit of quality theater is not in and of itself the pursuit of a better world. A group which he must help to create, that was Clerman's dictum, and that should be the test. Not whether someone, actor, playwright, business manager was present at the founding, but is that someone in a daily way, in a true way, helping to create the group? Does she have a voice? Is he present in his fullest stature? I love Mark Valdez's formulation, the process yields the aesthetics. The way we make work is not merely as important as what we make, it is what we make. You can see it with individual artists as in the work of these vital companies populating our current seen unseen landscape. Process reveals itself through result, improvised Art feels discovered. Shared creation feels cooperative. The monastic project emanates its own fanatical purity. Aristocratic creation feels refined. Democratic art feels welcoming. The way we say hello carries who we are. Where will our messiahs come from? Who will they be? The student studying you from the back of the classroom? The intern answering your phones. The playwright who can't yet find the sound of her own voice and so has begun to perform her own work. The performer who has just begun to write. Your old friends. You. How will they gather? How will they practice what they preach? How will they revitalize the old and reveal the new? Where are they now? Look around. Thank you. Uh, 
so much to think about. Thank you so much, Todd, for your beautiful words and emphasis on the process. Um, we have to break for lunch, and that break for lunch means we also have to vanish the space a little bit because there's going to be a rehearsal here while we're in here. So uh, if you could uh, skip away, uh, those on New Play TV will be back after the lunch break. Uh, check back in with us. Take care. <laughs> Thank uh you. -huh.